same traditions. That's an amazing thing. So uh, that's why we share those things. It connects us with that song of humanity and the song of Jesus Christ. And so let us prepare our hearts as uh, we get ready for our sermon for today. The bulletin insert is in front of you, I hope, in your bulletin. You're welcome to pull it out as I read the gospel lesson. And it's entitled, Becoming Who You Are. And our lesson begins in John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on on a Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They've taken my Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've placed him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. And they kept, were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. He stood up and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And so Simon Peter arrived and went inside and also noticed the linen wrappings. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings, then the disciple had reached the tomb. First he also went in, he saw it and believed. For until then they hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus said that, he must, that Jesus must rise from the dead. So they went home, and Mary was standing beside and outside the tomb crying, and she wept. She looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they've taken my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they've put him. She turned, she turned to leave and saw something standing beside there, and it was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus what? asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the, just the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken away the body of Jesus, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned and she cried, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have yet to ascend to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I'm ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord. And then she gave them this message, the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Bless our time together, with God. Open up our hearts that we too might be transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ this day. We ask it in your name. Amen. Terry, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me as we prepare for a sermon today. Upstairs, by the pulpit, just to the left as you're looking at the pulpit, is a big reflective thingy. You'll know what I mean. Okay? I need that for the sermon today. And so as we begin our sermon for today, I want to start kind of flushing out the story of Mary Magdalene for you. Some things that you may know, some things that you do not know about Mary. One of the things you may not know about Mary Magdalene is that she has mentioned 12 different occasions in the gospel accounts more than any of the, uh, the apostles except for Peter, James, and John. Isn't that amazing? So obviously she is a central and key figure in our gospel accounts, and I think sometimes she's been much maligned. Now she may have been a woman who is an outcast, who is broken. The Bible says that she had seven demons that our Lord had cast out of her, but the one thing that many Christians believe, especially in the West, that is absolutely not true, she was not a prostitute. And you're saying, wait a minute, I've been taught that she's been a prostitute all my life. Whoever told you that was wrong. And you want to know where that tradition comes from? A guy named Pope Gregory I, who in 591 AD was trying to find a way to, to squelch and get rid of all those noisy women. And Mary was the hero of their faith. And so he decided he was going to preach from a pulpit how Mary was just a prostitute possessed by the seven deadly sins. Now you know where the seven deadly sins came from. And so from then on, in the Western Church, she became a punching bag for the sins of humanity and representative of that. Thank you, Terry. That's really important. You'll see in a moment. And uh, so she became that punching bag and a punchline, a joke, in the Western Church, dismissed. It's just that prostitute who's a sinner who's filled with all these wicked desires. But that was not Mary. That was Pope Gregory. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that that's what she was. 
So if for some reason we've continued to believe the witness of a liar, sorry, but Pope Gregory was a liar, to one of the great saints of the church. How do I know she was one of the great saints of the church? First of all, the Bible says so. The Bible gives her a nickname. What is her nickname? Magdalene. What you may have thought wrongly, what you probably were told, is that Magdala is a city, which is true, in Galilee on the shores. It is true. Maybe she was from Magdala. But she wasn't called Mary, the woman from Magdala. She was called Mary, the Magdalene. Why is that important? Let me tell you. I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. I know, this is on your mind. Why was she called Mary, the Magdalene? In fact, if you went to many different places, there's actually written witnesses outside of the Bible that say, Oh, the Magdalene stopped in. They didn't call her Mary. They called her the Magdalene. Why would they call her the Magdalene? Here's the punchline. Because it's a nickname that means the fortress or the strong tower. You miss something here by not knowing that that's what her nickname is. Because remember, there's another guy in the Bible that also has a nickname called The Rock. No, not Dwayne Johnson. Okay? Sorry. That was Peter. So you see the beautiful symmetry that the Bible is trying to give to us here? The rock and the strong fortress. Peter and Mary. The Bible presents Mary as the great female disciple, the apostle to the apostles. That's not my words. That was the words of one of the early church fathers who met Mary Magdalene and said that the Magdalene is a fortress a rock upon which the church is built. She is the apostle to the apostles and a great woman of faith. Why do I say this? Aren't we here to talk about Jesus today? We are. But I think to understand Jesus, we need to look at Mary because she is the very first witness of the gospel and the very first person whose life was truly transformed by the good news of the resurrection of God. The fortress, the foundation, the rock of our church. So I want to show you something. Because before Mary was touched by Jesus, she didn't think very highly of herself. She thought she was no good. She thought that she was worthless. She thought that she was unworthy of being loved. But Jesus touched her, cast out those demons, and she became that great fortress of the church. Now I'm going to show you something that might scare you. See, she's already saying, no, don't show me that. Okay, take a look. I know you're looking at everybody else but yourself, aren't you? Pointing at the ceiling. Sorry, is that better? <laughs> yeah. Pointing at the people yeah. watching the camera. What do you see when you watch that? You see camera within a camera within a camera within a camera. <laughs> if you've got high enough HD, that's what you're seeing back there. So take a look at yourself in the mirror. And I know a lot of you are like, oh, I don't want to look at that. Why? Because you've been buying into a lie. I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm ugly, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm too that. I'm not enough of this, I'm not sufficient there. You know what you are? You're like Mary before she was touched by the good news of Christ. When Mary was touched by the good news of Christ, she became what she was created to become, the fortress. And I am telling you, you don't see it right now, but staring back at you is a fortress, is an amazing person. And you need to stop dismissing that person. So I'm going to tell you, here's the good news. Oh, thank you. You took the mirror away. Oh, it's coming back. <laughs> it's coming back because you're going to see yourself differently in just a minute. Because I'm going to tell you the message that transformed Mary's life that changed her into this broken, bruised, beaten woman into a woman who is a fortress of the church of Jesus Christ. Because this is what God wants to do for you, and this is where you're welcome to pull out your hand up for today. Because what I'm going to do is tell you the four things that transformed Mary's life. Number one was the hope that she had in Jesus Christ. She understood that there was something bigger to live for than herself. Something that gave her purpose. Something bigger than you can possibly imagine. Greater than the eye can see. And so the fortress, Mary, <coughs> cast her lot upon this hope, and she was all in, to use a poker term. She gave it all. She was saying, I'm all in. So that's why she was so, so distraught 
on that Easter Sunday, even more so than anybody else. She was the only one who was all in. Do you know that she is the only person, one of the only two people consistently mentioned who was there for the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ? She was the only one that was there, along with Mary. Well, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, wasn't there for all of those things. Mary Magdalene is the only person who was there for all three of those events. She was touched by God. She was a fortress. She threw herself all into this. Okay? All in. It reminds me, there was a study that was done to find out how people define themselves in their lives. And it was done by psychologists, and they studied in particular atheists and agnostics. In a post-Christian and post-religious age, they wanted to see how people define themselves. And one of the shocks they found out is even people who were atheists and agnostics, who grew up atheists and agnostics, believed that there had to be some type of purpose and meaning in life. I would say that's probably something placed in there by God. So even atheists and agnostics knew that there was something lacking in themselves that had to be defined by something outside of themselves, and they were hungry and searching for that. That's what that psychological study showed them. But we have the advantage as Christians, we know what that is, and that is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And so we go on. She understood she had hope in this Jesus, that she had an inheritance in his kingdom. That made her royalty. So imagine that. If you are an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven, you are royalty. You see that looking back at you in the mirror? I told you I'd bring it back. Do you see a prince or a princess sitting there? No, I know Mia we're looking, and that's a prince, princess right there. But I'm serious, you as parents see your daughter that way, but do you see yourself as a prince and a princess? Do you see that's who you are? You are heavenly royalty. Not my words, these are God's words. So don't take my word for it, this is what Jesus says of you. I'm not done about that hope. The promise that you are royalty, that you are an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven, that you have hope in Jesus, is it only as good as the person who makes that promise. And in this case, it's God who makes that promise. Oh, God just created the universe, right? So I think if God created the universe, God can keep his promise to make you a prince or a princess royalty in the kingdom of heaven. Believe it. Because God promises it. The second thing. So hope. We have hope in Jesus. The second thing that Mary found in Jesus that I'm hoping you find is love. And this love is unconditional love. Now, I know that some of you grew up in families where that love was conditional. It was based on what you did or did not do. I'll love you only so long as you do this and you satisfy me. Well, that's a bunch of bull. I'd like to use another word, but I'm not because I'm on air. And I have younger ears here. It's a bunch of bull, okay? God loves you as you are always unconditionally, 24-7, 365, all the way to eternity. And there is nothing you can do, nothing you have done, nothing you will do that's going to stop that. So deal with it. You're stuck with God. Okay? That's such a bad thing, isn't it? Isn't that a great security? Because we often, we're just running around, oh, i got to please God, i got to do this, i got to do this right. Stop saying that word, i got to, i got to. Get rid of that word, I got to, out of your vocabulary. You don't got to do anything to please God. You're just one of his kids, and he just loves you. Without reservations, forever means forever and ever and ever and ever. Before your birth, God loved you and knew your name, it says in the Bible. Knew your name. Thousands of years before you're born. Isn't that what I always say? The Bible says that in the book of Psalms. That's what I say oftentimes when we take a communion, don't I? That 2,000 years ago, Jesus was thinking of you sitting here right now. Jesus knew your name. Throughout all the stages of your life, the, the, the bad stages, the good stages, stages where you do some really stupid things, I've done a few stupid things in my life. No, not yet. Yes, I have. No. I have. True, all true. I've done some really good things in my life, but God is there through all of those things. Because we always have purpose and meaning in God. Beyond the grave, you will not be forgotten. 
Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's a scary thing to think 100 years, nobody's going to remember who you were. 50 years, probably, nobody's going to remember who most of you were. Okay? But God will never forget your name. You will never, ever, ever, ever be forgotten. I find great comfort in that. Third thing that Jesus does for us, forgiveness. Just like love, forgiveness is unconditional. Same thing, available to eternity, 365, 24-7, 365, all the way to eternity. And you know what? When you are a receiver of forgiveness, that should always preclude any type of bitterness. God never has any bitterness towards you. We are called not to have any bitterness towards others. Not always an easy thing on our end. But God never have, holds bitterness against you, ever. No matter what you've done, He always loves you. Wounds and heartaches can all be forgiven in whatever's gone in the past of your life. And so what you need to do with all those wounds, all those heartaches, all those things that have been perpetrated on you by other people, you have to stop rehearsing them. Stop going over and over and over and over them again in your head. Just stop. Because God doesn't hold that against you. God does what? Forgives you. God doesn't say, oh, I forgive you until you do it again. No, he forgives you. It's gone. Stop rehearsing your heartaches, your wounds, your, the, the heartaches of your life. And the lastly, number four, the fourth thing that uh, Mary was so impressed with that changed her life, that made her into the fortress that she was, that I believe is going to change your life, is that God gave, gives us new life in Jesus Christ. Now, I know we do out of uh, change, but we change out of gratitude. So please understand this. You don't have to change in order to impress God. You change because God just loves you. And you're like, I just want to love God back. I don't have to. God accepts you as you are. But I change because God just loves me. Not out of any need or any expectation or any fear. If you've got fear in your life, there's no business for fear. You should not be afraid, because God casts away all fear. Here's what God does. God lifts up the marginalized and leaves no one behind. So I know some of you might think you're a geek, and you're just an outsider. You're an outcast. You're somebody that nobody else accepts. Those are the types of people that God really, truly loves. Not that God doesn't love all the other people, but the people who think that they're just so much of an outcast that nobody else could possibly love them, you're, 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 you are God's type of person. Because God wants to get a hold of your life and say, I accept you for the geek, for the crazy person, for the whatever person that everybody else has missed, I accept you as you are. Have you ever felt like that sometimes? That you're the outcast? You're God's type of child. God adores you. Trust me when I say this, because look at the disciples and the choices that Jesus made. Every single one of Jesus' disciples were the outcasts, were the people that nobody else accepted, the island of misfit toys. And that's what we are as the church of Jesus Christ. So, I'm going to show you this again. And I want you to see yourself a little bit differently. I want you to look in this mirror, and I want you to see yourself the way Mary, the fortress, saw herself. Up now, I can't do this right, can I? Yeah. Everybody's a critic. Okay? Mary, the fortress, stood in an empty grave in tears, didn't see that Jesus was standing there, but when she finally wiped her tears away and looked up into the eyes of Jesus, guess what she saw? She saw herself for what she truly is, the way Jesus saw her. And here's what you are. You are not worthless. Anybody ever told you that? They're liars and of the devil. You are not worthless. You are heavenly royalty. You are not a bum. You are a child of God. You are not a worthless human being, as some people want to tell you in life. I am just worthless. You're just no good. No, you know what you are? You are God's masterpiece. Masterpiece. You're a masterpiece of the master himself. There is nothing wrong with you. You are the crowning jewel of God's creation. You are 
not no good. That's what a lot of people want to tell you. You're just no good. No, you're not. You know what you are? You are the image of God. That's what's staring back at you. And so if you have a problem believing this, maybe what you need to do is post this beside your mirror so that every single time you look in the mirror, you look at this and you say, well, you can cut off the left side of this and just say, you know what? I'm heavenly royalty. I'm a child of God. I'm God's masterpiece. I'm God's image. Wow. Now if you see what changed Mary's life to make her the fortress that she is, when you look in the mirror tomorrow or tonight, I want you to see yourself for how God sees you. Because God didn't create you to be this timid, sheepish person. You are heavenly royalty. You are a fortress. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for helping us to see who we truly are in Jesus Christ. We are royalty. We're the handiwork of God. We're the image of God. We are precious in your sight. So when all those temptations and all those words of the world just keep coming and attacking us, help us to change that tune. Put on a different CD, God, that plays in our heads, that tells us who we truly are. Because everybody else who says something different is a liar. And so, God, I ask you to touch the hearts of everybody here so that they might leave this place with the confidence to be the heavenly royalty that you made them out to be, to be that fortress, to be like that hero of ours, Mary, the Magdalene. We just give you thanks for these witnesses, for the witnesses of faith, for the Magdalene and the Rock, who stood as witnesses to what you can do with somebody's life when you touch them. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Corey, you